Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our virtual HOA Condo Academy, which is the duties and responsibilities of board members and how to handle board member burnout. So thanks, everybody, for joining us here today. I know that many of you are probably just tuning in right now on Zoom and Facebook Live. So welcome. Um, welcome to class number three of our virtual HOA Condo Academy in partnership with the cities of Avondale, Chandler, Glendale, Goodyear, Mesa, Peoria, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Surprise, and Tempe. Uh, my name is Beth Mulcahy, and I am the managing partner and senior attorney of the Mulcahy Law Firm in Phoenix, Arizona. I've enjoyed working with and representing as legal counsel, um, you know, many associations, over a thousand associations for the past 26 years um, and throughout the state of Arizona. And I currently serve on my board and have for many years. Um, and so I'm just wondering if I'm curious, I'm getting messages from my team, which is the wonder of technology, that there may be some difficulty this morning hearing. Um, and so if anybody's having difficulty hearing, can you place it in uh, the Zoom group chat under the question and answers? Or if you are um, joining us on Facebook Live, just put it in the comments section and we'll make any adjustments that are needed. Before we dive into the topics for today, I'd like to just start off by getting a feel for who's in attendance today. Um, so I can best tailor the information uh, for all of you. So we're going to be launching two polls right now um, at the same time. And the first poll is going to be, and for those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, all I'd like you to do is just answer in the comments section um, on Facebook Live, um, you know, what your answers are. So the two polls are, um, number one, which city do you live in um, or which city do you reside in uh, when you're in Arizona? And then number two, let us know your current role on the board. Are you a board member? Are you an interested homeowner? Are you a manager or other? And while we're getting those poll results um, from all of you, and we appreciate your participation, because I want to do a good job on the seminar today and, and make sure that I tailor it to who the audience is, let's just take a, a brief talk uh, sidebar and talk a little bit about what, what our topics are for today. So in today's class, we're going to be talking about the Arizona uh, legislature's HOA and condo bills that have been introduced in 2023. I'm going to give you a very brief overview of that. Um, I'm also going to talk about um, FDIC insured banks in light of the kind of the banking um, crisis that we saw about a week ago, um, Silicon Valley Bank and a few other banks. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what's important for associations to know um, about FDIC insurance. Then we're going to go in and talk about um, the duties and responsibilities of board members and how to best handle board member burnout. Um, I can tell you, um, I was just reelected to my board in uh, December, and I'm feeling the burn a little bit too. So I'm giving you some suggestions on how you can stay fresh and engaged as a board member if you're starting to get a little tired. So we'll finish up the class with that. Um, and as always, uh, at the end of the class, we'll have our free question and answer. Um, and I encourage you to submit questions via the Q&A box or on Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook Live throughout the presentation. Um, because I answer the questions in the same order that they come in. Um, and you'll uh, be able to have your questions answered earlier um, in the Q&A portion. Um, so we encourage you to, to uh, submit those questions throughout the presentation. But we do ask that you limit it to one question per person, please. And we also ask that you're really specific in your question. Because of the live virtual platform that we're doing, it's very difficult for me to ask a clarifying question if I don't understand the question. So be really to the point um, and be specific about what you'd like me to answer in your question. Okay, let's see who is in attendance today. Hopefully we've got our poll results coming back up here very soon. Okay, it looks like we have for which city are you... Are covered here today are, are present. We have Chandler is 4%, Glendale 13%, Goodyear 2%, Mesa 21%, Peoria 6%, Phoenix 28%, Scottsdale 21%, and Tempe 4%. So welcome to all of you. Um, in terms of who's here today, we have 74% of you are board members, 11% are managers, um, and 11% are interested homeowners, and then 4% fall in the other category. 
So we have a really high representation here today from um, three different cities, for sure, Mesa, Phoenix, and Scottsdale, and, and a good representation from Glendale and a few other smaller cities, too. So that's great. And lots of board members, um, managers, and homeowners, with the majority being with the board members. So welcome, all of you. We're going to have a great class today. Okay, so what we're going to start with is the first topic is that the Arizona legislature is in session, and they've been in session since the second week in January. And there were 18 bills that have been introduced so far in 2023, which is a large number, um, which is kind of expected because we've had a couple, a quiet year for HOA bills in uh, 2020 and 21. Last year, there were a lot of bills introduced, but not that many actually that ultimately passed. Um, so having 18 bills this year is a lot. Um, it's on a variety of topics that we've seen this bill, a lot of flag bills, bills on home-based businesses, short-term rentals, solar panels and water devices, annual meetings, indemnification of board members, requests to review books and records of the association, insurance, parking on streets, referendums, and of course, political activities. Um, of all those 18 bills that have been introduced this year, there's really only six that seem to be moving in the direction of actually having a possibility of passing this year. So I wanna just talk very, very briefly about these six bills. Um, the first bill would make it so an association cannot ban any historic version of the American flag, which would include the Betsy Ross flag. Um, kind of an unusual bill, right? I mean, I'm kind of surprised that that's something that's you know charging forward this year, but. Um, nonetheless, that's one of the six bills. Um, another bill that we're watching is a bill on home-based businesses. Um, and this bill would make a home-based business um, shall be allowed to, as a use uh, by right if the home-based business does not supersede any sort of deed restriction, covenant, or agreement restricting the use of the land. Um, it can, cannot also violate um, the master deed or any other documents pertaining to the association. Um, and also a county cannot prohibit a no impact home-based business or require a person to apply for, register, or obtain a permit, license, or variance um, to, to have a low, no impact home-based business. I mean, I think this is obviously, this bill is a reflection of what's going on in our country. A lot of people are now working from home. Um, and I think it's important that the legislature feels it's important that this be clarified um, by this law. Um, the next bill is, is deals with condominiums and insurance coverage and claims. And this would require the association to maintain insurance on common elements and the units. It would give each owner the right to report a loss under the association's insurance policy, which you know is different than typically how it's handled now. The association typically makes a claim on the association's policy. Um, and it just goes on to make some additional changes on the insurance. Um, I'm not gonna go into all of them because there's a lot, um, but we have a summary that we're gonna be sharing with you shortly here. Um, another bill talks about public roadways in a planned community. This is just kind of a correction um, an addition, additional language regarding a correction bill that was passed um, several years ago. And basically, it talks about whether or not the association can regulate on-street parking. And if this bill passes, there's going to be an affirmative responsibility for associations to have a vote of the membership on whether the association should still be able to regulate parking on a public roadway. Um, because many associations are have public streets um, and the association can regulate the parking on those public streets. And so this is just kind of a fine tune on that. The next bill talks about political activity and this bill would prevent an association from restricting an owner from conducting door to door, door, -to -door political activity, including solicitations of support or opposition regarding candidates or ballot issues. And it also would prohibit um, and may not prohibit an owner from circulating political petitions. So basically just kind of opening the floodgates to allow owners to go door to door for political activity. Um, and also we can't prohibit an owner from um, circulating political petitions. Um, the next bill talks about meetings um, in a homeowners association, and this is just a technical correction bill. Um, it just would change it to be the board or the owner shall provide written notice of a meeting. 
And it also changes um, the secretary to secretary or representative um, designated by the owners, which could be like the management company. Um, so basically, we've got these six bills that we're kind of closely watching. We have a great summary of these six bills if you want to take a deeper dive. Um, and we're going to be sharing our 2023 legislative summary with you shortly here on Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, just so you know, each week that the legislature in Arizona is in session, our firm posts an updated summary of the pending HOA and condo bills that are moving through the legislature. And you can find that summary on the homepage of our firm's webpage at mulcahylawfirm.com. And that's updated every week with what's happening in the legislature. So basically the roadmap for the legislature now for the next few months um, is going to be that, you know, we're watching carefully what's going to happen with the state of Arizona's budget. Um, because typically once that budget is passed, it's a 50 yard dash to get the rest of the bills, um, you know, into final form and either passed or, you know, held um, or declined to be um, accepted. And so last year, the legislature went right till the final date, right before the 4th of July, um, at the end of uh, June. I don't think that's going to happen this year because we've already seen some pretty, um, you know, deep budget discussions. Um, and we've already seen our, our new governor who has um, been very active in, um, you know, making her feelings known by vetoing bills. So I think if I had to guess, um, I think we'll probably see um, the legislature close down before Memorial Day this year, but we'll have to wait and see. So regardless, we'll keep you posted. Go to our website for any updates um, each week with the legislative updates. OK, let's talk about the recent bank failures. Um, Kind of a scary topic, but it's important for us to talk about this because this directly impacts HOAs and condos um, throughout the United States and, of course, in Arizona. Um, so I'm sure most of us were watching um, the news and saw that Silicon Valley Bank um, and Signature Bank um, were taken over by federal regulators um, in the past few weeks. Um, and this is troubling really to all industries who have money held in United States banking um, institutions. And so I think this raises really important questions. And it's a good time for just a reminder and a refresher about what are best practices for associations, funds, and what types of things you should have in place to keep your bank, uh, you know, the money that you have in your banks or in CDs safe. Okay, so first, let's start out by saying bank failures are rare. But let's be real here that over the years, we've seen, you know, many different banking issues with SNL issues and, um, you know, issues in 2008. Um, and, you know, just throughout my career, I've seen kind of a cycle of issues, whether it's, you know, the banking industry or, you know, real estate prices significantly declining or real estate prices significantly increasing. This is something that's notable and we need to talk about it. So um, even though bank failures are rare, um, when it does happen, um, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which kind of the nickname is the FDIC, um, will cover checking, savings, CDs, and money market deposits accounts up to $250,000 per account holder. Um, and so basically what that means is that if you have like let's say that your association has $200,000 in you know, ABC Bank. Um, you want to make sure that that bank is FDIC insured, number one. Um, you want to make sure that you have less than $250,000 of association funds in that one bank. And it, it goes by the account holder, right? So the association with their tax ID number, that is considered the account holder. Um, and you know, what you want to be careful of is sometimes you'll hear, well, we have a CD with ABC Bank and we have a checking account and we have a savings account. And, you know, each one of those accounts can have, you know, up to $250,000 insurance. No, that is not right. Basically, whatever the association can only have, you know, up to $250,000 that is insured by the FDIC at any one bank. Um, and so, you know, what we see a lot with associations is that 
sometimes management companies have a relationship with a bank. And, you know, when you hire that management company, they suggest that you use this bank that they bank a lot with. Um, What you need to be is proactive if you're a board member. And how you can be proactive is making sure that you don't have all your money tied up with one bank. I mean, it's fine if you have less than $250,000 in total at that bank at any one time. Um, but if you have more, which, you know, a lot of associations have with reserve accounts and, um, you know, CDs, et cetera, you really want to keep an eye on how much you have at any one bank. And so what we recommend to limit risk for associations is that HOA and condo board members need to take a close look at the funds they have um, in banks and the amount the association has in total in each bank. And the best way to limit risk for associations um, in light of, you know, the things that happened with Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, even though the government bailed out the banks dollar for dollar in that case, that may not happen in the future if there's, you know, a global banking crisis. So we really urge you to be careful and to limit risk by A, insuring with a, or keeping your money with an FDIC insured bank, number one have less than $250,000 of the association's funds on deposit with that bank at any one time. Um, A good way to spread out the risk is um, there's a program called CDARS and um, you you can put CDs and get CDs um, at different banks um, and it's all um, FDIC insured. um, And that is a good suggestion. Like my association where I'm on the board we have, I don't know, maybe 10 different CDs at any one time, all with different banks, all under the $250,000, um, you know, FDIC insurance limit. Um, you know, don't let your management company or anyone else pressure you on this. You have to do what's best for your association. And best practices, in my opinion, is to keep Um, less than $250,000 in any one banking institution so that you are insured that you have FDIC insurance coverage should the bank have any sort of financial trouble or be taken over by um, the federal government. One other thing you might want to do is to take a look at the stock prices of the banks that you have money in. Um, Is the stock price stable? Um, one of the warning signs on Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank was their stock price started to tank. Um, And so it's just an added thing that you may want to consider doing. Um, To confirm if a bank is FDIC insured, um, you look for the FDIC sign at your bank. Usually it's in the window. Or you can ask your banking representatives. Or you can use FDIC's bank find tool. Um, and my office is going to be sharing with you the link to the bank find tool. And then you can double check using that tool online to see if your bank is insured or not. Um, for more information on FDIC insurance, we're also going to be sharing with you um, a link to um, the FDIC's government webpage and resources, um, which has frequently asked questions and answers um, through the FDIC. So please take a look at that at your upcoming March or April board meetings, um, especially the treasurers. You have a responsibility, a fiduciary responsibility of the corporation to make sure that that's being handled property, properly. Okay, let's switch gears and talk about our main topic for today. Um, we're going to be talking about board member roles and responsibilities. So my goal for today is to make sure that you leave this class knowing the most important things that you need to know about Arizona law, federal law, um, and your just general duties of being a board member in your association. So let's start out with a little poll. Um, The first poll question that I have is, do you fully understand and have a high comfort level with all of the duties and responsibilities of serving as a board member? So if you can answer on Zoom um, on the the live poll, or if you can answer on Facebook Live by answering in the question and answer, um, that would be great. While we're waiting for those poll results to come back, um, let's just kind of dig in a little bit and start talking about what are the most important things you need to know about your duties and responsibilities of serving on the board. Um, Just as some introductory remarks, I would just like to start out by saying that 
you need to recognize that when you are elected to your board, this is, um, you haven't spent your entire life preparing to be a volunteer on your board at your association. If I had to guess, most of you were elected or were asked to be on your board because nobody else wanted to serve, or maybe you showed up at a meeting and you were concerned about something and you got roped into being on the board. Um, and so it's not most of, in most cases, we find that, um, you know, board members come into serving on the board and they quickly realize that this is a lot more than I thought it was going to be. We have to deal with homeowner complaints. We have to maintain the common areas. We have to oversee the financials. We have to, you know, manage our manager, work with the management company to make sure that all of the responsibilities that we have are being accomplished in a timely manner. And it's a big job. Um, and the longer you're on the board, sometimes the more you realize how many additional responsibilities there are. Um, so kind of interesting. We got the poll results back. Let's start with that. 58% um, of you say that you feel you, you understand and have a high comfort level with the duties and responsibilities of being on the board. 36% say no and 6% aren't sure. So we have a, a good representation. I'm, I'm wondering if the 58% have been listening in on our seminars over the years and that's why they have, um, you know, a high comfort level. I hope so. Um, because, you know, one of our, you know, main objectives, one of my main objective, objectives and the main objectives of our firm is to provide free education so that board members do have a high comfort level and understand and follow the law. So that's great to hear. Okay, let's talk first about um, what it's like to serve on the board. Um, so first, remember that even though you're a volunteer and it's unpaid job being on the board, your owners and members look to the board to provide caring leadership and service um, that makes living in their community association desirable. Um, and we can't forget that the board of directors is overseeing what might be one of the largest assets that any owner has in their in their lives, their home. And because of that, we have to treat this as a business and we have to make good decisions and follow the law, follow the association's documents and conduct ourselves in a professional and business-like manner when we're serving on the board. Um, and so let's just dig right into what are the general responsibilities for the board? Um, and so, you know, the first thing that I would say is the first thing you want to do is play, you know, a participatory role. So if you are elected to your board or appointed to your board, you need to show up at meetings. You need to be on time. You need to come to the meetings prepared. Um, typically, a management company will provide you with a board packet. Um, a few days before the meeting, you should do a quick spin through the board packet um, the night before the meeting. You know, I do that some months. I spend more time you know, like an hour, or maybe even two hours, but most times when there, you know, isn't something that's, you know, really a big issue, I'll spend 15 or 20 minutes. I just page through it quickly. So I get the feel for what the meeting's going to be about, what we're going to be asked to vote on, make sure that we didn't forget anything that I want to have added to the agenda. Um, and look through last month's meeting minutes, do my pre-read on that. So when that comes up at the meeting, I have already read it and I'm ready to vote or to make comments for any changes on last month's meeting minutes. Um, the second thing that you, you need to do when you're serving on your board and a good time to do it is usually right when you're reelected or when you're appointed is to read through, understand and be in compliance with your association's governing documents. So what those documents are, are the CCNRs, the bylaws, the articles of incorporation, the rules, the architectural guidelines, if your association has any. And this is not like a, a five hour read. No, this is like a 15, 10 to 15 minute read. Just page through the documents and have a general awareness of what's in what documents. So just briefly, the CCNRs are the use restrictions. Um, it's the obligation to pay assessments. Um, it's insurance requirements, uh, you know, basically the the nuts and bolts of what you can and can't do in your association, what the obligations of the owners are, what the obligations of the association are, how you can use your property or not use your property. 
Um, the bylaws are going to be how to run the board. When is your annual meeting? How many board members are there? Um, you know, the officer election, how do you elect officers and um, what month your annual meeting is, that type of thing. The rules are going to be just general conduct on the common areas. They can never conflict with the other documents. Um, the architectural guidelines are going to give us guidelines on how the property you know, should appear and what's acceptable and not acceptable, what will be approved or not approved by the architectural committee when reviewing applications. So, you know, in brief, kind of the two things, the two things that we've talked about is you have to participate, be engaged, and you have to do your homework, so to speak. So every month, read those board packets and at least once a year, do a quick spin through all of the association's documents. Okay, the next thing that we're going to talk about is fiduciary duty and responsibility to the um, corporation. So just in, in summary, this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say here today. So everybody should have their antennas up. So when you serve on your board, you have a fiduciary duty to the association. So what does that mean? Um, it means that you have to place your interests as a homeowner in the community um, you know, secondary to what's best for the entire association when you're making decisions. So there are three duties that I want to talk about um, that I think are important for you to be aware of. Number one is the duty of care. So when you're making decisions as a board member, um, you want to be uh, making informed decisions. Um, you want to be hiring licensed and bonded contractors. Um, you want to get enough bids so that um, if you're having a large capital improvement project that you are making sure that you're paying the market rate. Um, it's just exercising the care of a reasonably prudent person who is serving on the board. And you don't have to have any specialized knowledge going in. It's just being showing care in the decisions that you're making regarding the association, reaching out to your trusted advisors your lawyer, your management company, your insurance agent, your reserve specialist, you know, just taking care and making the decisions that you're making for the corporation. Um, the next duty is the duty of confidentiality. Um, and this means that you're going to hear the juicy scoop about things while you're serving on the board, whether you know it now or not. During your time on the board, you are going to hear confidential information. Um, typically, that's going to be heard during executive sessions. And um, during those executive sessions, the board will be talking about issues um, that are, you know, one of the five executive session topics. The most common ones that we have are advice from your attorney, um, enforcement, violations, delinquencies. Maybe there's problems with a contractor and you're discussing performance of a contractor. Anything you hear as a board member during executive session you cannot talk about with any other person, not your spouse, not your friends, not your tennis group, not your pickleball partner, not your walking friends. Um, and that's really something that can be hard because, um, you know, you come home from a meeting and maybe you're upset about something or you heard something that's like, wow, that's crazy. I can't believe this is happening. Anything you hear in executive session, do not talk about with anybody other than the board. Um, and so that's important, the duty of confidentiality. And that is something that we see, unfortunately, a lot of problems with with board members. Um, and so be careful on that. Keep things confidential that you hear during executive session. Um, the third duty is a duty to avoid self-dealing. And what that means is you cannot profit any way personally, um, financially from serving on the board. Um, and that you know, basically means you shouldn't be paid by the board for something, you know, maybe some extra thing that you might be doing for the community. You shouldn't be on the payroll. You should not be on the payroll. Um, it's our opinion that you shouldn't be hiring friends and family to um, assist the association on maintenance or anything else, any sort of a contract. We think that's a very bad idea. So just making sure that you're not benefiting personally by serving on the board financially by serving on the board and no none of your friends or family are also benefiting from your service on the board. So those three duties, really important things for you to remember today. Duty of confidentiality, right? 
um, duty of care and duty to avoid self-dealing or um, having a financial interest or making money from serving on the board. Okay, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about another responsibility that you have um, when you're serving on your board. Um, you are responsible for overseeing the community, right? Making sure that things are being maintained um, and treating the association's facilities and the service that's provided as a business. So making sure that the community is being maintained and at a high standard, um, making sure that you're hiring licensed and bonded contractors when you're hiring vendors to come into your association, very important. Um, you also have to oversee your management company if you have one. Um, and remember that your relationship with the management company is that you're a team. This should not be, you know, a negative relationship. This should be that we are working together to make our community better. And so, yes, you are the management company's boss when you're serving on the board, um, but you are basically just overseeing them to make sure that they are doing the responsibilities that they're supposed to be doing under the contract between the association and the management company. And so some general things that you can do to oversee the management company is making sure that the finances of the association are in order um, you know, checking the bank statements every month, looking very carefully at the financial statement um, and the balance sheets that are provided to you, um, you know, overseeing the budget preparation every year for your association. That's typically done um, in the late summer months, early fall, um, making sure that the association has the proper insurance in place and making sure that we're renewing it in a timely manner. Uh, remember that um, 60 days before the insurance policy renews, we'll get a notice, um, you know, whether or not we're going to be renewed or non-renewed, um, making sure that we carry the proper insurances according to our association's documents, making sure our bills are paid on time, such as our utility bills, um, and any other bills that the association may have. Um, like I said, make, making sure that the landscape you know, company is doing what they're supposed to be doing and that the palm trees are trimmed um, at the appropriate time each year and that the overseeding is done or not done, depending on the recommendation of the landscape company. Um, you have to pay taxes when you are, um, a, you know, a corporate entity that's a nonprofit corporation in Arizona. You have to pay state taxes and federal taxes um, and you have to file taxes. They were all due March 15th. Um, for, you know, state and federal taxes for associations. Um, and these are all just things that your the management company is kind of making these things happen and you're overseeing them to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Now, if you have a situation where the management company isn't quite up, up to snuff, a good way to handle it is to talk to the manager first. It's a manager assigned to your association. Explain expectations um, talk about things that need to be improved. If you don't see improvement after you have the talk with the manager, then you need to go higher up in the management company and talk to maybe a regional manager or the manager of managers, or maybe even the CEO of the company, depending on how large the company is. Okay, some other things that you're responsible for as a board member um, is following the open meeting law. So in Arizona, we have our own special open meeting law. It's different than the open meeting law that applies to school boards and to um, city council. Um, we have our own special law in the Condominium Act and the Plan Communities Act um, for how boards run their open meetings. And so basically the bottom line on this, this is that associations first have to give 48 hours notice of the board meeting to the membership um, prior to any board meeting. So that can be done by putting it on your website, conspicuous posting on the property, sending an email out to the members. All of those are fine under the law. Then when you actually get into the meeting, um, remember that anytime a quorum of the board is meeting to discuss association business, it must be an open board meeting. And that means that we have to give 48 hours notice to the members um, members should be allowed to attend, listen, and participate at appropriate times during the open board meeting. Um, and appropriate time for members to be able to talk would be um, some boards have what we call a homeowner forum at the beginning of the meeting and let members talk during that time period, maybe for a minute each to air grievances or um, you know give praise to the board for what a great job you're doing. 
Um, you also have to allow members or owners to uh, talk before the board takes formal action on it and on anything. So if the board is voting on something, the members should be allowed to, if they want, they should be allowed to make a statement before the board votes or takes formal action on anything. Um, so just remember that we have a special open meeting law for Arizona. Um, we have a cheat sheet on this exact topic. I think two cheat sheets that you can find on our webpage if you want to do a deep dive and you want to, um, you know, better understand the open meeting law. You can find that on our webpage at mulcahylawfirm.com. Um, also, another responsibility of the board is um, that you have to follow the association's documents. So we talked a little bit about earlier that you need to be aware of what the documents generally say. You also need to follow what the documents say on, um, you know, use restrictions for the property, um, making sure that owners aren't making architectural changes without getting approval of the architectural committee or the board, um, overseeing uh, the management company, if you have one, to make sure that owners are paying assessments in a timely manner because, you know, assessment income is what funds the association. So, we want to make sure that we don't have a high delinquency problem of owners who aren't paying their assessments in a timely manner. Um, you know, you also have to you know, be aware of what the bylaws say, and, and hopefully the management company is guiding you, but how many board members you should have and follow that and when our annual meeting is, and you need to follow that. Um, and, you know, when there are violations, there should be like a violation report that's provided to you by your management company. And, and then the board will need to make decisions on how we handle these violations of the CCNRs. Um, speaking of violations, kind of a good segue into the next topic is um, that you need to be aware that if you want to find an owner for a violation, that you have to give notice of the violation and an opportunity to be heard before you levy the fine against the owner. Um, and that's something that sometimes new boards, you know, they say, oh, we have the right to find an owner for, you know, making a change to their property without getting architectural approval. Levy that fine right now, send a letter and give them a $50 fine. Well, you can't do that under Arizona law. You have to set it up with two different letters. So the first letter is giving them notice of the violation and an opportunity to be heard. Um, and mentioning that a fine could be levied against them. You have to wait for them to do the opportunity to be heard. So typically boards will uh, put in the letter that owners can write back, send an email or a letter to the board. And then the board makes a decision to actually fine the owner after they see the owner's response or not find the owner. And then if they are fined, a letter goes out saying you've been fined this amount. So it's, it's a setup procedure to do fines in an association. Okay, let's talk about another right of association members. Um, just so I make sure you're not sleeping, I'm gonna do a quick little poll here and find out. Um, we're gonna talk about records requests next. So the question that I have for you in our poll um, is in the past year, has an owner in your association requested to review, inspect, or copy the association's books and records? Just curious, anybody asking to see records? Um, just so quick primer on this as I'm waiting for the poll results to come in is that as a board, as an association, whether you're a HOA or a condo, we have the requirement to comply with an association member's request to review the books and records of the association. Um, and basically how it works is that owners are allowed to see basically anything in the books and records of the association. There's few exceptions that they can't see. But just as a general principle, owners, members of the association have a right to see almost every document that belongs to the association. There are some exceptions, which would be like advice from your attorney or if we're involved in litigation. Um, as an association, they can't see anything regarding the litigation. Um, they also can't see any personal information um, about an owner, which might include like their email or their cell phone numbers. Um, but generally speaking, there's a lot that owners can request. And as a board, you just need to know that um, there's a time period we have to respond. So once the owner puts it in writing, asking for, let's say, the last five years of meeting minutes, um, you know, we have 10 business days to respond to the written request. 
And if they want copies, we can charge them 15 cents a page. Um, and so, you know, if you ever get, you know, sometimes you get these requests and the information is on the website already. Um, all the minutes are on the website. So you can just pop back an email real quick to the person requesting it saying, these documents are already available on the website and you've complied with the records request. Other times we have to go digging for the records. And so, you know, as soon as those records requests come in, we need to get to work on them right away because we only have 10 business days. If somebody is asking for something that's going to take longer than 10 business days, what you want to do is you want to respond to them immediately and say, I see that you're requesting 30 years of records for the association. We are going to need longer than 10 business days. We're going to need, you know, 30 days or whatever it is, because you may have to go to offsite storage or something to get all this information. Good communication right away on the front end on that is smart because if a judge looks at this, if the homeowner sues saying they haven't given it to us in 10 business days, the judge is going to see that you were reasonable. You gave a reason why it's going to take longer and you gave them an expected arrival date for the records. Um, but just kind of as a, a reminder, uh, as a responsibility of serving on the board, if owners want to see records, we have to give them almost all of the records with few exceptions. In terms of just the poll results, interesting, 47% of you said, no, we have not had a records request. But 36% say, yes, we have in our association in the past year. Um, and 17% said, I don't know. So just a closing point on the records requests. Um, remember that, uh, you know, usually the person that is making a records request, they fall into two categories. Either they're disgruntled or upset about something, and now they're going to go on a fishing expedition to find records or they're a high detail person who needs information, needs facts, and they want to find the facts to support, you know, whatever worries or fears they have about the association. So um, if you get a really large records request, um, you might be able to narrow the scope by picking up the phone and talking to the owner and saying, what exactly do you want? Um, whenever an association asks me to be involved in a, a records request with somebody who is upset with the association or for whatever reason, usually if it's a really big one, I'll call them and say, you know, hey, we received your request for 30 years of records. Um, that's a lot of records. Can you kind of tell me what's going on? What's prompting you to request these records? And can is there any way that we can narrow the scope of this so that you actually get the documents that you want to answer the questions that you have? Um, I've been really successful in narrowing something that could have been, you know, a 2000 page, you know, requirement to provide documents to them down to five pages. Um, and one thing you want to remember too, is if it's a board member's time or an attorney's time or the manager's time, putting these records together for a records request, we cannot charge the owner for that. We can only charge the 15 cents per page copy charge. Um, so it's in our best interest to try to narrow the scope because this could take hours for a manager or a board member to put the records together. Okay, another important thing to think about when you're serving on the board, you know, a responsibility, in my opinion, best practices is to communicate with your owners often. The boards that communicate the, off the most or the most often with your owners, guess what? They have the fewest problems. So how do you communicate with your owners? Um, you know, send out newsletters, have a bulletin board, post information on it, have a website with your meeting minutes there so anybody can go and see them at any time. Um, send out weekly updates or monthly updates to your community about what's going on, what, you know, are challenges that you may have. Um, because the more you communicate, the fewer problems you're gonna have. So it's like a really proactive strategy to make sure that your time on the board is um, hassle-free, stress-free, because if the owners already know all the information about what's going on in your community, they're going to be less likely to buy in when somebody knocks on their door who is you know, negative Nelly talking about how horrible the association is. They're gonna already have the facts that, well, the pool is you know, being renovated. It's going to be finished by March 31st or whatever. March 30th. 
um, or the hot tub, you know, the heater broke on Friday, but it's going to be back in service on Tuesday. If, if you communicate well with people, they're going to be less upset. Um, you know, if they show up at the pool and they were planning a pool party and, you know, now it's closed and they didn't even know it, then you're going to get people who are upset. So remember, it's really important to communicate um, throughout your time on the board with the owners. Um, and this should be official board communications. It shouldn't just be like one board member going off and starting a Facebook page or um, one board member sending out an email under their name. This should be sent out under the association's um, umbrella. Okay, another important thing um, that we talked briefly on um, when we're talking about the management company is the association has a duty and a responsibility to prepare a budget every year. Um, and we have a great cheat sheet on this topic um, on our website. It's um, how to create a budget for associations. Um, you can find that at mulcahylawfirm.com. The budget is typically done every year in the summertime, late summertime, early fall. Um, and if you want to do a deep dive on that, um, check out our cheat sheet. Um, typically, the management company and the treasurer work on the first initial draft, and then they bring it to the board for comment and approval. Another thing that you are required to do under Arizona law that I just want to make you aware of as board members or if you're a homeowner in your community um, that is concerned about fraud in your association, um, associations must have their financial records audited, um, reviewed, or a compilation done every year. Um, and that needs to be done between January 1st and June 30th. Um, if your fiscal year end date is December 31st, which most of our clients have that year end date. Um, and so just know that you have to have an audit review or compilation done every year. You do not have to have an audit done by a CPA every year unless your bylaws require that. There's that kind of loophole under the Arizona law um, that says unless the, your bylaws or your CCNRs require an actual audit to be done um, by a CPA, um, it can be done, you know, by other forms in your community. So it could be by committee, it could be by the treasurer, um, you know, the review, compilation, or audit could be done by anybody else. Um, so the statute's a little bit loose in that it doesn't say that this has to be done by a CPA unless your bylaws require it. Um, but it's an extra protection to make sure that there isn't any fraud going on in your association. And as a homeowner, you're allowed to request to see the audit, review, or compilation that's been done by your community. Um, you know, and the association has until June 30th, and you could request it after June 30th each year for the prior year. And the association will have to provide it to you within 30 days. Okay, um, the next uh, topic that I want you to be aware of is don't forget that you have to have insurance as an association. We have a great cheat sheet on this topic on our webpage, mulcahylawfirm.com. The insurances that you are required to have for associations are you're going to need to have a general liability policy. Um, if you're a condominium, you're going to also have to insure the buildings. Um, you should have directors and officers insurance. Either it's called DNO or ENO, errors and emissions, or directors and officers insurance. And that protects the board in the event that you are sued as a board member for any decisions that you make, um, that the association's insurance company will step in and defend you. Um, you also should have a fidelity bond for fraud. Um, and really look at that fidelity bond, the amount. Um, a lot of times it's a, like an add-on to your director's and officer's policy, and it's only like $25,000 or $50,000. You really should have you know, enough of the fidelity bond coverage um, to cover the amounts that you have in your bank accounts um, because it covers employee dishonesty or theft and you want to be made whole if that should ever happen to your association. Um, you know, and it, you want to look to your association's documents to make sure that you're carrying the proper insurances for your association. If you have any employees, you're going to need to carry workers' compensation insurance um, you know, and, and just double check your association's documents again to see if there's any other special requirements for insurances. Um, also, another thing I want to talk to you about having a dream team. So every association should have a dream team of professionals that they work with to help them make good decisions. So dream team typically starts out with if you have a management company. Um, you know, making sure that you are hiring one that you are happy with, that they're doing their job, that they give you good advice. 
Um, you want to have an insurance agent that you know. So you want to have some sort of a relationship with them, either have a phone call with them annually, invite them to a board meeting, invite them to a Zoom meeting. And the reason why it's important to know your insurance agent is because when there's an insurance claim, you don't want to be 1-800. You don't want them to put you off to a 1-800 number to make the claim. You want to contact your insurance agent if it's on a weekend or nighttime, which is when usually these insurance claims are come to fruition. And you want them to answer the call and help you process the claim. So dream team member, having an insurance agent that you know. Um, working with an attorney that is familiar with and specializes with um, community association law, representing condominiums and homeowners associations. You want a specialist on this and making sure that that attorney is on your side and you know not in cahoots with the management company. You, know, you want an independent attorney that specializes in this area to be giving you the best advice. And my goal as an attorney working with associations is to keep you out of trouble. I don't want you getting sued. I don't want you um, having to go in front of um, the attorney general's office for a fair housing complaint under federal law. I don't want you, you know, being a named party with the Arizona Department of Real Estate for violations of your association's documents or state law. Um, and so my goal is to keep you out of trouble. And so as your dream team member, um, I'm practicing preventative legal with you. I want you to reach out to me and talk to me about problems early before they escalate into a World War III, and it's going to cost a fortune to correct. So another important dream team member is your attorney. Um, another important person on your dream team, a reserve company with a reserve specialist who can advise you on how much money you should have in your reserve account. And um, that reserve company should come out to your property and walk the property. Um, they're saying now that reserve studies should be you know, updated once every three, four, five years. And so having that specialist come out to your property, walk the property, creating the reserve study for you, explaining to you how to read the reserve study and how much money you should be putting away so that you have enough money to make you know, large capital improvements in your association in the future. It's a planning tool and it's what the smartest and the most successful associations have is have a reserve specialist, have a reserve study that you've done and follow that reserve study so that when that pool needs to be replastered and it's going to be a $11,000 bill, you already have the money in your reserve account and you can do it the year that it needs to be done. You don't have to have a special assessment. You know, you don't go, you know, instead of having it being done in 11 years, you don't go to the 15th year when the county comes in and is shutting you down because you haven't done it. Um, it's just good planning, good financial planning and good strategy so that you repair these long-term capital improvements in your community on time and you're maintaining things in your community. Um, so, you know, these are the professionals that should be on your dream team. And as a board, you need to know these professionals and work with them so that you can make good decisions while you're serving on your board. Um, another important thing you have to do every year as a board is have an annual meeting. Um, and the annual meeting is your time to shine, to show your community, you know, these are the accomplishments that we had this year. These are some of the problems that we have and that we might be facing in the future. Um, you know, you elect new board members at your annual meeting. And so you want to make sure that this is a fine-tuned, well-run meeting each year. And we have a cheat sheet that can help you with that on our website called How to Have a Successful Annual Meeting. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, there are also some just like technical things that you have to do as a board. And there's just a couple more technical things. And then just a general comment that I want to make about serving on the board. So some of the technical things that you need to know about is that every year your association needs to file an annual report with the Corporation Commission. And that is something that you have to do annually. Um, it's a form that you do online. There is no reminder that is given by the state of Arizona for you to file your form. Um, no official reminder that goes to all nonprofit corporations. Um, there's a small fee that you have to pay and you just fill out the form online. Now, why is this important? 
it's important because if you don't fill out your annual report every year, if you miss filing it for a couple of years, what will happen is you'll lose your corporate status as a nonprofit corporation. And why is that a problem? It's a problem because the nonprofit corporation is a protection around the entire corporation, all the members. And if you're not a nonprofit corporation, the individual owners in the association are liable for the debt of the association. Um, and that's problematic. That's why we have corporations in place to provide a shield around, you know, the, um, the members or the owners. And so filing that annual report every year is very important. Now, if you're worried, hey, did my management company do this? There's an easy place you can check. Just Google Arizona Corporation Commission. And then when it says, look up the name of a corporation, you type your association's name in there to check the corporate status. You type in the name, click um, check, and your association's name will come up and it'll say right on the form with the Corporation Commission if you're in good standing. If you're in good standing, great, don't worry about it. But note when the annual report is due, make a mental note of that. And they had, the Corporation Commission has a special thing that you can do um, in that you can have an email reminder sent to anybody regarding when your annual report is due. Right then and there would be a good time for you to type your email in as a reminder to double check to make sure that your management company is doing this every year. The other thing you have to do as a corporation is we have to file state and federal taxes each year. The final parting point that I'm going to make for you for your responsibilities of serving on the board um, is please be nice when you're serving on your board. Have an approachable and business-like manner as a board member. I've been to thousands of board meetings over the past 26 years, and I've seen many associations excel at this and do a great job. Unfortunately, I've seen some other associations that you know, maybe they aren't nice or maybe they engage in unprofessional behavior when dealing with owners or they're rude or they don't listen. Listening to homeowners is a very important skill um, because sometimes there is a problem and they're giving us valuable feedback as a board. And if we're not listening, they're going to get frustrated and the problem is going to persist. So um, be nice, have an approachable and businesslike manner as a board member. And remember, this is in the board setting. Outside of a board meeting, if owners are contacting you to discuss things, what you want to say to them is, please come to the board meeting to discuss this because the entire board really needs to hear this feedback or write a letter or an email to the board so that we can hear this valuable feedback. Okay, where does a new board member begin? There might be some new board members here today that they're just elected to their board, or maybe you're in the percentage of board members today that said, hey, I'm not really sure what my responsibilities are. So here's a quick little 411 on what you should do if you're newly elected to the board. So like I said, do your quick spin through the documents, right? Um, number two, you might wanna take a look at the minutes of the association for the past year. So you just kind of get up to speed about, okay, this is how the meetings go. And these have been the issues in 2022. And so you just get a little background. And sometimes we even have like what I call board mentors and the board mentor will just have a, a non-quorum meeting with the new board member and just get them up to speed on, okay, this is, these are some of the things that have happened recently that I just want you to know coming on to being on the board. These are some important topics that have been an issue in the past year, and I want to give you some background information on it. Another important thing is know where you can find information on the laws that you need to know. Okay, our website for our firm is a wonderful resource for board members, new board members, managers. Um, so we have over 60 cheat sheets that are on a variety of topics pertaining to HOA and condo law. Anytime there is a hot topic out there that I feel boards need to be aware of, we write a cheat sheet or we write a blog on it. We were talking about the FDIC insurance the Friday that we were starting to hear, you know, rumblings, you know, on the news. By Monday or Tuesday, we had a full blog article out on it. 
warning board members and warning management companies, be careful on this. So our website is a great resource for you. Anytime there's a hot topic, anything that's going on in our industry, we're talking about it on our website. And that's at mulcahylawfirm.com. Um, you also want to make sure you're added to our mailing list because we are sending out weekly communications about things happening and free learning opportunities. So be sure to sign up. Um, you can do that on our webpage. You can also find state statutes and federal laws through Google searches. Um, you can find all of the Arizona revised statutes by going to azleg.gov. Um, and if you, you can find the reference to the statute on our cheat sheets, like the reference for the open meeting law or the reference to the statute that talks about records requests by owners. And then you can Google the actual statute online. Um, also, there are federal laws. We have a cheat sheet that's a very good cheat sheet that talks about federal laws and um, the Fair Housing Act and the importance of not discriminating against any protected classes when you're serving on the board. Um, and all federal laws are also located. Um, you can find those through Google searches. Um, and if you want just a quick summary, go to our website and look at our cheat sheet uh, that's actually called Federal Laws. Um, also, don't forget, don't ever miss a learning opportunity like this. I know for those of you who are here today, we have, oh my gosh, we have a great turnout today. I'm just looking at the numbers. We've got over 96 participants on Zoom and many more that are joining us on Facebook Live. So awesome. For, for all of you, I don't need to give this message, but for the board members who are on your board who aren't here today, remind them that there are so many free training opportunities for HOA and condo boards and all of the different cities that are, you know, co-hosting this seminar with me here today, they want you to have this free information so that you do a good job running your boards. And so that as homeowners, you're not frustrated about how your board's running. So don't miss opportunities to attend these free training seminars. We have this neighborhood services virtual um, seminar every the, the third Tuesday of every month at 11 a.m. Um, we have our first Friday free call-in the first Friday of every month where you can um, ask a question for free regarding your association and we provide a live answer. Um, and you can find out more about the upcoming classes that our firm is teaching by going to our firm's website at mulcahylawfirm.com. You can go to the different cities that you live in website and look at the different programs that they're offering on HOA and condominium um, law and information that can help you. Um, so we really encourage you to think about, um, you know, what free education there is out there that might be able to help your board. Um, one other thing that our, that our law firm has started doing that has been um, really a, a good tool for boards that, especially boards that are having some dysfunction. Um, is we come in and we do a boot camp with your board and we talk through what are the problems, what are the issues. We do a quick summary of Arizona law. We answer questions that the board might be fighting about and not have resolution on. And it's kind of just a really good time to bring your board together so that you can get things done this year. And so just know that our firm does offer those boot camps. Typically, we're doing them where there's either a level of dysfunction on the board or where the board has a lot of new board members and they want just a private education time where they can ask questions privately with their law firm. Okay, next thing I want to basically talk about um, is uh, in the, a code of conduct. This also kind of goes hand in hand with dysfunctional boards. Occasionally, boards need to have a, a code of conduct. And that it just gives them a roadmap for what's acceptable behavior for your board members. We have a great cheat sheet on this topic. If you're struggling with this, um, maybe you've got people that have loose lips and they're breaching their co confidentiality duties, or maybe, um, you know, your board meetings are a train wreck and you can't run them efficiently. Um, check out our, our cheat sheet on the code of conduct and have your board consider adopting a code of conduct. You just need a majority of the board to vote yes to adopt it. And then all the board members would be subject to it. Um, and it covers everything like fiduciary duties and um, all the different things that your responsibilities that you have as a board member. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Okay, our last topic for today, how to handle board member burnout. Um, you know, it's serving on the board is very rewarding. 
I can say that from personal experience, um, I've served on my board now at different times for over 14 years. And there are many accomplishments that I look at and I'm proud of. You know, if I'm walking around our neighborhood and I see things and I think, you know, I was helpful in getting that pool refurbished or the lagoon redone or whatever the issue is in your communities that you've been active in changing. Better flowers or better landscaping. Our landscaping's looking better. Um, our association is now fiscally responsible because I am overseeing things on our board. But that being said, I would be lying to you if I didn't tell you that serving on the board also can be a major hassle at times. Um, and a lot of people aren't honest about that, Frank, but I will tell you, even in a highly functioning board where things are going really well, there are times where I get upset about things that either aren't being handled properly or maybe we have a difficult owner. So there are times where it's not a pleasant experience, frankly. It's a hassle and that can wear on people over time. And so what I'd like to do is just take a little bit of time and talk about how can we handle, you know, board member burnout? What are some things that we can do so that we don't get to that point of burnout, right? Um, and so a few things, just some strategies, you know, first, let's talk about what does board member burnout look like? Um, you know, maybe you just have a board member that just stops showing up, right? They just stop coming to board meetings or they stop responding, um, maybe you as a board member are feeling upset about things, you know, and you come home from a board meeting and you're upset. Um, or, you know, maybe the board just isn't doing anything. You know, maybe they stop enforcing the documents. Maybe they don't have an annual meeting anymore. Um, don't have board meetings. Uh, that's potentially a sign that the board is totally burned out. Um, or maybe they know that there are lots of problems and they just never do anything about it. Um, you know, people quitting, you know, board members just saying, I've had enough. I don't want to deal with this anymore. These are all, you know, warning signs of what can be, you know, board member burnout. So um, what are some strategies to implement so that you don't get to this point of board member burnout where you're frustrated and you're upset and you think about quitting all the time? <laughs> okay. So what are some things that you can do? Well, first of all, you know, if you don't have a management company in place, think about hiring a management company because um, that is a way to take some of the burden off of the board members. Now, if you have a management company and you're still frustrated, um, then you need to communicate with the management company that your expectations aren't being met. And we already talked about talking with the manager, talk about what your expectations are. Um, you know, we expect that you are going to give us an email every Friday and let us know what happened at the association and what the plan is for the next week. Um, we expect that, you know, our insurance is going to be renewed in a timely manner. We expect that you are going to respond to homeowners in a timely manner and not blow off homeowners. Um, and if the manager is not doing it, then escalate it to higher management. If it's still not being fixed, then, well, maybe it's time to find a new management company. Um, some other strategies, um, make sure that you're talking to your trusted advisors. Don't suffer through a problem. If you've got a difficult owner that is driving the board crazy, reach out to your trusted advisors, ask for advice, talk to your attorney, you know, Hey, we've got this problem. How should we handle it? It's boiling over and, you know, we can't get this corrected. Um, a lot of times we see that with violations or maybe difficult owners who come to board meetings. Um, reach out to your trusted advisors, get us an opinion as to you know, how this can be handled or better yet, give that problem to them. Sometimes we see associations that have um, a really difficult owner. Um, and if you don't have that person in your association, by the way, you're really lucky because almost every association has one really difficult owner. Sometimes you just need to say to that person, we have tried to answer your questions. We have tried to help you. Um, we cannot, we're unable to help you. So we are going to transfer you to our attorney now. And all communications need to go through our attorney. And then let me as your attorney handle the difficult person. And I can assure you, I'm not going to be their pen pal. 
um, and I'm not going to let them, you know, call me 18 times a day. I'm going to set up a protocol, boundaries and expectations. And if they don't follow it, um, you know, there will be consequences, you know, we'll write them a cease and desist letter. Um, and so, you know, another strategy, so hiring a management company, reaching out to your trusted advisor to help you with frustrating and difficult problems, um, you know, set reasonable goals that the board can accomplish each year. A very common complaint or burnout factor is we never get anything done, right? That's something that people, I hear that often. We are dealing with dog poo problems and complaining owners and violations and delinquencies and our management company not, you know, getting things done that we asked them to do. And we're running in place and I'm frustrated because of it, right? If you're in that situation, what you need to do is as a board, look at the year and be like, okay, it's March. We still have nine months left of this year. What do we want to accomplish? And then map out a plan to get there. And we have a cheat sheet that can help you with this. It's called the Eisenhower Method. And it helps you prioritize your problems and things that you want to do in your community. So check that out on our website. That's something, it's a proactive way to say, okay, maybe we're trying to bite off too much right now. Here's what we want to do. Here's our goals for the rest of 2023. And come up with a timeline and um, determine what is important and urgent and focus on those things. And don't get caught up in the weeds of dog poo and complaining owners. Try to delegate that out so that you're not spending all of your time on that when you really need to be worrying about the reserve, are our finances in order, the long-term capital improvement projects that really need to be done in your community this year. Um, another thing is if you're having long board meetings and that's causing board member burnout, and oh boy, do I understand that because I, in the different years that I've been on boards, some board Board meetings have lasted, you know, an hour, which is the goal. Some have lasted five hours, which, you know, I leave that meeting feeling like I'm exhausted and unhappy. And so, you know, take a look at our cheat sheet on um, board meetings, how to have a board meeting in an hour or less. We give you some really good tips. And probably the best tip from that I can give you is the president. The president has to be in control of the meeting. And use a timed agenda where you say, okay, the meeting, the meeting starts at 7 p.m. And at from 7.05 to or 7 o'clock to 7.05, we approve last month's minutes. From 7.05 to 7.15, treasurer's report. 7.15 to 7.30, manager's report. And just outline this is how long we're talking about this topic. And if you're not finished with it by that time, you move on to the next topic and table whatever isn't discussed until you know next month's meeting. And what you'll find out is if you follow that timed agenda, you're going to get your business done in an hour and there's not going to be any irrelevant side talk and all this other stuff that makes these meetings so much longer. You're sticking to the agenda. Um, you know, one thing you, you might want to think about doing is, um, you know, outline board member expectations. So if you have people that aren't showing up for board meetings or, you know, are showing up unprepared, just a reminder to the board, like, hey, there's an expectation that you are going to attend the board meeting. If you can't attend it, let us know and we may reschedule it for a different date so that we're sure to have a quorum. And we expect that if there's an emergency, that you'll be make yourself available for an emergency board meeting. Or we expect that you're going to come to the meeting prepared and you're not going to waste everybody's time by sitting there reading the meeting minutes from last month's meeting, um, you know, and making us spend 10 minutes on that agenda topic when it really should be a two minute thing. You should have read it before you came in and be ready to vote on it or make comments on changes. Um, you know, and so a couple things, just some closing thoughts on board member burnout. So I have this little practice that I run for board member burnout that I do myself. So occasionally when you're serving on your board, um, you have to just turn the email off for a couple of days. Okay. And just let it be. Um, sometimes, you know, if you're on call 24, 7, 365 as a board member, it's going to burn you out. So sometimes on the weekends, I, you know, if there's some issue that, you know, we've been dealing with as a board, I will just say to the board, hey, I'm signing off email for this weekend. 
I'm not going to be handling any board business. I feel like we've had a very productive week. I'm feeling the burn and I'll check in with everybody next week, you know, and it's good to do that. It's good to get a break and also recognize that it's not a life sentence to serve on your board, you know, go on your board and, you know, you, you don't have to stay on for 10 years. But what you should do is leave the board in a good condition that when you're leaving and find good replacements so that there's a good positive transition and there's, you know, the business is going to continue to run in a professional manner after you're gone. So making sure that you've got the right management company, the great dream dream team, and that you're bringing in board members who care about the community and who want to do a good job for the community. So as you're struggling with board member burnout, also don't forget that we've all been there right? And you're always welcome to reach out to your trusted advisors to talk about it and um, commiserate. I've been there. I understand. Um, And just think about what are some strategies that we can do as a board so that we're not so burned out. Is, you know, is the management company a good fit if the board is doing all the work? Probably not, right? And so maybe we need to think about spending time finding a new management company that's going to take the burden away from us and make our time serving on the board more enjoyable. Um, And so these are just some tips that I have. Um, You know, if you have problems with disgruntled owners, we have a great cheat sheet. That's another thing that can really wear on board members. Um, You know, if you have difficult, disgruntled, or maybe, maybe mentally ill owners, you want to check out our cheat sheet on dealing with difficult owners because that gives some great tips on how you can effectively navigate that that situation. Okay, that's it for today. Um, I'm just going to make my concluding remarks. Um, a few things to mention as we look ahead to the new year. We have a more, many more learning opportunities coming up. Um, I'm so happy to, sh- to say that we had over 100 viewers here today just listening to this seminar. So thank you for caring about your communities. Um, Thank you for participating in your communities, serving on your board, being a caring, interested homeowner if you're here as a homeowner. As a manager, thank you for being here too, wanting to improve your skill set and help your communities that you manage. Our next upcoming um, seminars are on Friday, April 7th. We have our virtual First Friday free call-in, and I'm going to be answering HOA and condo legal questions live um, on Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, Additional details on how you can submit your questions and how you can tune in are listed on our website at mulcahylawfirm.com. You can can put questions to or submit questions to our firm for the first Friday on April 7th, starting right now through the morning of April 7th at 8.45 a.m. So if you have a question, you want to have it answered for free, don't forget about first Fridays. Um, Also, the City of Chandler is going to be hosting an HOA Academy mini-series next month. And we're excited to be a part of it. Um, Three classes are going to be in person on April 5th, 13th, and 19th from 5 to 6.30 p.m. Um, Hayden DiLorenzo from our office is going to be teaching those three in-person classes. Um, And we also have, I think there's also a virtual class that might be coming up for that one too, which will have, if there is one, it will be listed on our website. For more information on the classes in the city of Chandler, you can go to the neighborhood programs um, with the city of Chandler. Um, That's neighborhood.programs at chandleraz.gov. Or you can check out our website for more information. Um, Last but not least, don't forget the third Tuesday of every month, we have our virtual HOA Academy with all the different neighborhood services departments that we work with. And the next class is going to be on Tuesday, April 18th, and that's class number four. And the topic is going to be how to handle difficult owners and also how to handle difficult boards. So if your board's not getting along or if you have difficult owners who are making your time on the board difficult, um, be sure to tune in for that class because I have 26 years of experience turning around difficult owner situations and I've got a lot of good advice for you. So thanks again for joining us today. I'm so appreciative to um, the many different neighborhood services departments that partner with us for these classes. Thank you so much for being our team member, teammates with me um, to provide this free education to boards, owners, and managers to make your cities, HOAs, and condos better. We appreciate that and I appreciate the opportunity. I hope everybody that was here today has a wonderful Easter or Passover. And I hope to see you again next month at one of our upcoming learning opportunities. 
Take care, everybody. Goodbye.